I invite you to please rise as we sing our processional hymn on page 91, verses 1 through 3, Savior, when in dust to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father of mercies, and God of all consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may attend to your word, confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. I invite you to please be seated as we enjoy some music from our choir.
Let us read responsibly Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is evermore before me. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner with my mother conceived me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Then I will teach transgressions your ways, and sinners will return to you. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God. Will you not despise? Our first reading is from Joel 2, verses 12 through 19. Yet even now, says the Lord, return me to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave us a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord, for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room, and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare me, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery. By, by word among the nations, why should it be said among the heritage of mockery? Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had a pity on, on his people. A response to his people, the Lord said, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you mockery among the nations. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 28 to 21. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he may it be known to him that in him we might become trans rich righteousness of God. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, Ash Wednesday, is one of the few Christian holidays that has, been not, has not been hijacked by our culture. Consumerism hasn't taken it over with folklore, uh, characters putting gifts in socks and hiding eggs and candy. There are no 4 a.m. doorbuster sales on the first day of Lent. Families don't gather to watch the annual Ash Wednesday Peanuts special. Why? Because our culture is at a loss regarding this day that focuses on the certainty that all of us are sinners and all of us are going to die. Now, when we talk about sin these days, one of two responses is common. The first, by the more liberal, equates admitting that we are sinful with having low self-esteem. The second, by the more conservative, equates sin with immorality. So at one end of the church, uh, we're told that sin is an antiquated notion that only makes us feel bad about ourselves, so we should avoid mentioning it at all. While the other end of the church tells us that sin is the same as immorality, and totally avoidable if you just choose to be a squeaky clean Christian. Either way, the effect of boiling down sin to low self-esteem or immorality is that we turn it into something that we can control or limit in some way, rather than something that holds us in bondage. Both cause us to overlook or downplay the reality of our sin. The liberal response tells us we can do whatever we want so long as it makes us feel good. And the conservative response teaches us to hide our struggles with sin from public view and even from ourselves. Both views actually worsen our guilt and our shame and cut us off from the freedom of the gospel. But the reality is that we cannot free ourselves from our bondage to self. We cannot keep from being turned inward on ourselves. We cannot, by our own understanding or effort, disentangle ourselves from our own self-interest. And when we think that we can, we are trying to do what is only God's to do. Enter King David, a man after God's own heart. He had received favor and blessing from God, the covenant promise that his offspring would sit on the throne forever, far beyond what was promised to any other person in biblical history. 
We love to teach our children the story of David and Goliath, but the David, Bathsheba, Uriah story isn't taught in Sunday school. Because King David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then covered up his adultery by arranging the death of her husband. After the time of mourning, then King David took Bathsheba, who was still pregnant, as his wife. For a year, David had kept his sin hidden until the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to confront him. Nathan told a story, which we heard on Sunday, uh, of a rich man who took the only beloved pet lamb of his poor neighbor. He killed it and fed it to his guests, though he himself had many flocks of lambs. David, a shepherd, responded with outrage, saying, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this thing deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. To this, Nathan said to David, You are the man. King David, directly confronted with his sin, And God's wrath responded, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Though David and his family suffered the consequences of his sin, God did not take back the promise that he had made to David to be his God. And so King David wrote Psalm 51, which we read responsively today. He wrote this after Nathan had confronted him. It's a beautiful confession. In it, David makes no excuses for his sin. He doesn't try to justify himself. Upon hearing the word of the Lord, David's time of hiding his sin from himself and everyone else had come to an end. Any delusion that David had about God being unaware of his sin, we uh, delude ourselves by thinking that, well, this was shattered. And so David revealed his sin to everyone in this psalm. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin, he said, is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. God's word had given David a broken and contrite heart and spirit. David knew that he deserved condemnation by God for taking uh, a life and taking a wife. But the word of God repented David From God's gracious response to his grievous sins, David learned the true nature of God. His Lord is a God of steadfast love and abundant mercy who forgives sins. His conscience had been so heavy from the weight of his sin that he felt that his bones had been crushed. But with the words, now the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die That burden was lifted. David was set free. Those words created within David a clean heart and a new and right spirit. The Lord restored to David the joy of God's salvation, having been made a new creature who relies not upon his own righteousness, but upon the promise of God, David's lips are filled with God's praise. And so David wants nothing more 
than to tell everyone about what God has done, even if it means that they know his own most personal sin. David knows that hearing the word of forgiveness from the Lord is the only word that gives true joy and gladness. Now, we have a deep fear of confessing our actual sins to God. It makes us feel exposed and vulnerable. It's like exposing our neck. We fear that God will go for the jugular, digging his teeth into our necks, going for the kill. But today, on Ash Wednesday, in our confession of sin, we expose our necks to God. With our confession, we are saying we give up. We give up trying to deny that we are sinners. We give up trying to justify ourselves. We give up all our excuses. We give up all our self-sufficiency. Today, we acknowledge that the wages of our sin is death. We acknowledge that we cannot save ourselves. And we acknowledge that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. And in his great mercy, our Lord Jesus Christ responds to our confession with steadfast love, saying to you and I, I have put away your sins. You shall not die. With this word, he blots out our iniquities. He purges us with hyssop, washing us clean and making us whiter than snow through his own precious blood. With this word, Christ promises that he will never cast you away from his presence, and he will not take his Holy Spirit from you. This promise creates within us clean hearts, raising us up as new creatures who hear the forgiveness of sins as words of true joy and gladness. Yes, we are dust, and to dust we shall return. But Christ, not death, has the final word which gives us eternal life. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able as we continue our worship on page 194. Almighty God, you created us out of the dust of the ground. The ashes imposed upon our foreheads remind us that we are dust and shall return to dust. They also remind us of the cross of Christ by which we are given eternal, everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us make confession to God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have offended you and for which I justly deserve your punishment. But I am sorry for them and repent of them and pray for your boundless mercy for the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Forgive my sins, give me your Holy Spirit for the amendment of my sinful life, and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. Through his Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God who called us out of darkness into the splendor of his light. 
By Christ's authority and in his stead, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, I now uh, invite you, for those who wish, uh, you may come forward and kneel as you're able or stand if you're not able to kneel uh, to receive the imposition of ashes uh, and a word of absolution. Uh, we will sing continuously uh, on page 296, not hymn 96, but page 296, Jesus, Lamb of God.
does that every so often. <clears throat> Merciful God, by your command, we meet together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you may cleanse and make our hearts new, our, make new our hearts stained by sin, that we may know a clear conscience. We pray you to bring us to genuine repentance, pardon all our sins, and renew our faith. Save and defend your church, we pray, from all our enemies and the enemies of your word. Give us faithful pastors and teachers who will gather your sheep by the voice of your word. Feed them upon the rich food of this blessed sacrament and lead us into your everlasting presence. Guard those in authority over us, especially our president and Congress, that our laws may be just and apply and justly applied to the punishment of the evildoer and for the pursuit of virtue. Where our laws are unjust or contrary to your word, lead them for your mercy's sake to right the wrong so that we may act in good conscience as citizens of this land. Deliver from darkness those who do not know Jesus, and bless missionaries and all who bring the light of Christ to shine. Give us courage to teach our children well that they may know your ways and not depart from them. Bless the places where your people gather around your word, those who teach and those who learn. Comfort those in any distress and grant healing to the sick, peace to those troubled, and your presence to the dying. Especially, we pray for those who have requested our prayer. Bill Halter, Marge Wellner, Mickey Meidel, Carolyn, Dermont Wells, Carol Carlson, Sherry Fenger, Mary Hollis Sternberg, and Alice Trebish, as well as those we lift before you in our hearts. Bring us through trouble and trial by your grace, that we may sing anew your wondrous love and mercy. Deliver us from the love of things and keep our hearts from the idols who would distract us from your abiding love and favor in Christ our Lord. Give to us generous hearts that the poor may be relieved and the work of your kingdom unhindered by any lack. Accept with the worship of our hearts the tithes and offerings we give in gratitude and thanksgiving. Bless us on this holy day of repentance that we may hold fast to your word, die to self, and serve you faithfully all our lives until at last you bring us with the blessed saints into your presence forevermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Can you hear me now? Is it working? In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the beautiful prayer that our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ has prepared the feast. Come to the table where you are welcomed home.
I invite you to please rise as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Receive now this blessing. God who fills the creation with abundance. Christ who spreads his arms in forgiveness. The Holy Spirit who draws, us ev draws ever near to us bless you and bring you to life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is on page 221, Sent Forth by God's Blessing.